Remember, we're in the Minor Prophets, the last 12 little books of the Old Testament. So if you come to Isaiah, which is a pretty big book, then you get Jeremiah, and then Ezekiel, then Daniel, then you hit the Minor Prophets, okay? And it goes Hosea, Joel, Amos. So we're in our third book of the Minor Prophets. So Barb and I ventured out yesterday, uh, went to the mall. The mall was packed. I couldn't believe it. It was packed with people. I, I drove up there and, what are all these cars here for? Walk in and they're just people everywhere. So anyway, I guess we're getting through this COVID thing. And uh, so I'm looking forward to opening up in our phase three again in November. So that will be great. Phase three, is, as Bob already mentioned, is our Sunday school classes, our Bible hour electives, and uh, those things. So looking forward to that. <clears throat> so a country preacher decided one Sunday to skip services and head to the hills to do some bear hunting rather than preaching. As he rounded the corner on a perilous twist in the trail, he and a bear collided sending him and his rifle tumbling down the mountainside. Before he knew it, his rifle went one direction and he went the other direction, landing on a rock and breaking both his legs. That was the good news. The bad news was that the ferocious bear was charging at him from a distance and he couldn't move. So he prayed. What else could you do if you can't move? He prayed, oh Lord, I'm sorry for skipping church services today to go hunting. Please forgive me and grant me just one wish. Please make a Christian out of that bear that's coming at me. Please, Lord. And that very instant, the bear skidded to a halt, fell at his knees, clasped its paws together and began to pray aloud right at the preacher's feet. Dear Lord, bless this food I'm about to receive. (laughs) Now, I don't know if Amos ever went bear hunting, but Amos was what we might call a country preacher, working our way through the minor prophets, but a major message. And Amos, today, we come to the book of Amos, and we call him the country prophet. It starts off in verse 1, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. The words of Amos. So who is this Amos? You know, Amos is, this is the only person in all of Scripture named Amos. He's not named after anybody famous before him. He's the only famous Amos in Scripture. His name actually means burden bearer. We don't know why, perhaps because he bore the burden of preaching against the nation of Israel. But Amos was a a simple man from a simple town called Tekoa. Tekoa is about 10 miles south of Jerusalem, about eight, six miles south of the little city of Bethlehem. A small town on a rocky hillside between two valleys that descended down into the Dead Sea. From your window, if you had a house in Tekoa, from your window, all you could see was desolate Judean wilderness. It was literally a town on the edge of nowhere. Amos was truly a country prophet. He had no royal blood. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a a seminary graduate. He was just a simple shepherd and a farmer from the country. In fact, Amos uses two different words in the book of Amos for the word shepherd, for his vocation. One of them here in verse 1, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. The other one we find in chapter 7, verse 14, when he's having a little dialogue with uh, a priest named Amaziah from the town of Bethel. We'll get to chapter 7 in a while. But both the words that he uses for the word for, for shepherd are very rare in the Old Testament. Not your normal words for shepherds. They're only used once or twice. The, verse, uh, the word here in verse 1 simply means a sheep raiser, or it could refer to a sheep trader. 
the word in chapter 7 refers to a herdsman. And so we really can't determine from these words if, if Amos was an owner of the flocks or he, if he was simply a hired hand. The context of chapter 7 would suggest that he was a, a very humble, simple shepherd, not a wealthy uh, individual. And so, but he's also a farmer, we find out from chapter 7, a caretaker of what we call sycamore trees. He was one who would go and pick the sycamore fruit. The sycamore fruit was a fruit that was given to to poor people. It wasn't a a great fruit, but it was very similar to figs. So he put all that together, and Amos was not educated. He's not wealthy. He's not powerful. He's a person of very humble means. In fact, in chapter 7, verse 14, he tells the priest in Bethel that he is not a professional prophet, even though there was actually a school for prophets at that time. Amos is just a layman, a blue-collar worker, with no formal seminary, academic, or religious training of any kind. That in and of itself is a very important lesson for us to learn from the book of Amos. God doesn't always use just the educated and the wealthy or the powerful people. You do not have to be a professional preacher for God to use you. You don't have to go to seminary for God to be able to use you. God can use anyone. In fact, the truth is that God likes to use everyday people to do his work. There's lots of room for country preachers, country people to be used of God. So a little bit more about the setting of the book. He goes on in verse one and he says, what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. So we can learn from that phrase a little bit of the, of the setting of the book of Amos. We don't know exactly when this earthquake occurred, although it's pretty clear archeologists that can identify that there was an earthquake sometime back then, but we don't know the exact date. But we can pretty well date Amos in the mid eighth century BC, probably about 760 BC, because we do know when King Uzziah and King, uh, and King Jeroboam reigned in Judah and Israel, respectively. And so Amos actually prophesied about the same time as the prophets Isaiah and Micah. We also know that Amos is a prophet to the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. Even though he's from Tekoa, way in the south, in the wilderness of Judea, uh, of Judah, God sent him north to the kingdom of Israel. This is a period in the mid eighth century BC when both Judah and Israel were prospering well. They were both enjoying political stability, uh, economic prosperity, and even expanding their territorial borders as well. But their success and their prosperity also led to pride and indifference, moral decay, and social injustice. And so God was not pleased. God was tiring of Israel's idolatry and their oppressive greed. And so verse two says he roars from Zion. He thunders from Jerusalem. And in doing so, he uses this country preacher from Tekoa named Amos to deliver his message to Israel. The book is actually easily outlined. Chapters one and two are prophecies against the nations, the neighboring nations. Chapters three through six are sermons against Israel. Chapters seven through nine then are visions of judgment ending with, as many of the prophets do, a promise of hope and restoration. So let's kind of walk our way through it. Obviously we're not gonna be able to look at everything in detail, but we're just gonna walk our way through so we get an overview of the book of Amos. The first two chapters are prophecies against the nations. In these chapters, Amos prophesies, first of all, against Israel's neighbors before zeroing in on Israel herself. So first of all, we have judgment on Israel's neighbors. Let me read just one of those prophecies because they all sound very similar. But beginning in verse three, down through verse uh, six, this is what the Lord says, the three sins of Damascus, Damascus is the capital of Syria in the north. Even for four, I will turn back my wrath because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. I will send fire upon the house of Hezgiel that will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. 
I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile to Kerr, says the Lord, says Yahweh. Amos actually, that's in one example. Amos actually utilizes a, a, a kind of a formula in each of his oracles against the nations. Let me just kind of walk you through this formula that he uses. He always starts off with, this is what Yahweh says, the God of Israel, the God of Judah. In other words, these are not the words of Amos. These are the words of God, Yahweh, almighty God. Then comes a numeric formula for three sins, even for four. Basically, what that means is that for your repeated and your ongoing sins against God, Then he says, I will not turn back my wrath. God says, I will not turn back my wrath. In other words, God cannot let their sins go unpunished. This is simply a reminder of the righteousness of God, which cannot ignore sin. That's followed by specific indictments, largely largely their sins against humanity. As they went into war against other countries, they were very brutal, barbaric, in fact. That's followed by an announcement of judgment. In each case, Amos says, I will send down fire. Clearly, a pronouncement of divine judgment. Kind of brings back memories of Sodom and Gomorrah, where God rained down judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. And then an elaboration of the judgment that extends to the rulers and the people, and then the closing words says the Lord. So he starts off and he says, this is what Yahweh says. He ends with, says the Lord. Kind of bookends there. But what is interesting about these, as you read through this chapter, chapters one and two, is that Amos cleverly arranges these prophecies so that he crisscrosses the borders of Israel. If you take a look at your map at the uh, bottom of your sermon outlines, or we'll put it up here on, on the PowerPoint as well, but you can't see it super well there, but it's, it's in your outlines as well. Uh, let me just kind of walk you through what he does. He starts in the northeast with Syria, Damascus, the one passage we just read. Then he moves from the northeast to the southwest, Gaza, Have you ever heard of Gaza? You've heard of the Gaza Strip, right? That's where many present day Palestinians live even today. Then he moves back up north to Tyre, present day Lebanon in the north, and then south again to Eden and Ammon and Moab, present day Jordan, southeast of Israel. All three of those nations, Edom and Ammon and Moab, are actually blood relatives of Israel, Ammon and Moab, If you go back in history, they were sons of Lot, Abraham's nephew, and so these are all of their descendants. The Edomites were descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. And then Amos even includes Judah as one of the neighbors of Israel, fellow Israelites to the south. All this crisscrossing of Israel going back and forth kind of serves as what I would call a literary noose around Israel's neck slowly tightening as as Amos zeroes in on what's really his target audience, the nation of Israel. And so then he concludes this section in verses 6 to 16 with judgment on Israel uh, to the north of Judah. Let's read it, starting in verse 6. This is what the Lord, Yahweh, says, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Then he actually goes on and identifies them. The other ones, he didn't identify all the sins, but here he he begins to identify some sins of of Israel. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. I destroyed the Amorite before them, though he was tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt, and I led you 40 years in the desert to give you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up prophets from among your sons and Nazarites from among your young men. Is this not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Now then, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. The swift will not escape. The strong will not muster their strength. 
and the warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground, and the fleet-footed soldier will not get away, and the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. In other words, you cannot escape God's judgment. So he, the list of charges against Israel includes things like selling people into slavery, oppressing the poor, engaging in illicit sex, perverting justice, drunkenness, mistreatment of the Nazarites, a, a group of people that had taken a vow to God. And this comprehensive list of sins, I think, indicates that Israel is really the target audience that Amos has in view. He didn't identify all the sins of the other nations, but he clearly identifies the sins of Israel here. And, he, and I think his inclusion of Judah in many of his prophecies against Israel throughout the book clearly links the two nations together as well. They are both the people of God. And so he starts off with the neighbors. He zeroes in on Israel. And now in chapters three through six, he's going to expand on that as well. Sermons against Israel in chapters three through six. I call these sermons because each begins with the phrase, hear the word of the Lord. That's what a sermon is. It's supposed to be the word of the Lord. That's why we preach right out of God's word. This is the word of the Lord. Again, we don't have time to read or study all these chapters, but let me just highlight a few things. Chapter three starts off with Israel's judgment is imminent. It's impending, it's coming. Begins with a reminder that that Israel is truly God's chosen people. God had brought them out of Egypt into the promised land. In other words, they are a privileged people, but with great privilege also comes great responsibility. And Israel failed in their responsibility to keep God's covenant. And so God is judging Israel, perhaps an even greater judgment than some of the nations because they were God's chosen people. And the chapter reads kind of like a courtroom setting. God sits as the just judge. Several witnesses are called in and he concludes with judgment. God will destroy the altars at Bethel, it says. Bethel being the center of idolatry in the nation of Israel, one of the centers of idolatry. And part of the judgment is also destroying the luxurious homes of the wealthy, those who exploited the poor. That brings us then to chapter four, where we see that Israel's warnings of judgment are ignored. Verses four through five begin with by identifying some more of Israel's sins, idolatry and empty religion. Uh, But before God judges a nation, this is something to always remember. Uh, It is clear in the book of of Jonah. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. But before God judges a nation, he always gives a warning. And that warning basically serves as a gracious call to repentance. God loves to extend mercy, but he is still just. He is still righteous, and so he has to deal with sin. But he does issue some warnings. And so we see those warnings in, in Chapter four, verses six through 15. Let's read these, if you will. I I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, and yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but did not get enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many times I strike your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword. Along with your captured horses, I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire. Yet you have not returned to me declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. Because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. He who forms the mountains, creates the winds, reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns down dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God Almighty is his name. Did you see that? There are at least six different warnings that God gave to the nation of Israel. The first in verse six is famine and hunger. 
The second is drought, no rain for the crops, no water to drink. They went from city to city looking for water. The third is destruction of crops with disease and, and swarms of locusts. Remember Joel last week? The fourth is plagues, disease, and pestilence. Fifth is military defeat, killing many Israelites by the sword. And then the last one is fires of devastation like Sodom and Gomorrah. And every single one of those ends with the phrase, yet you have not returned to me. I'm warning you. I'm sending some harbingers of judgment to come. Yet you have not Return to me. Allow me, if you will, to paraphrase these verses with America in mind. I sent invading terrorists who attacked your country on 9-11 and killed 3,000 people and destroyed your symbols of economic prosperity. Yet you have not returned to me. Oh yeah, there was a brief uptick in church attendance after 9-11, but it sure didn't last long. So I sent the worldwide pandemic that hit America and Europe really hard. Yet you have not returned to me. I've sent economic collapse along with that pandemic that is bankrupting and closing hundreds of small businesses and wreaking havoc on personal finances. Yet you have not returned to me. I sent hurricanes and tornadoes year after year after year that have deluged cities in the east and the southeast, the supposed Bible belt of America, yet you have not returned to me. I sent the, the Racho windstorm through Iowa that literally wiped out many of America's crops, yet you have not returned to me. I sent scorching fires across the west California and Oregon and Washington and other states that have literally wiped out their forests and entire communities, yet you have not returned to me. I have sent political upheaval, social unrest, protests, riots, looting in your major cities, yet you have not returned to me. Could they be harbingers? Warnings of God's judgment for America? How many warnings must God give America before America returns to God? Unfortunately, America seems to just kind of thumb its collective nose at God and tries to handle everything itself in its own way, kind of like Israel did. And God eventually poured out judgment, his wrath on the nation of Israel. God is still righteous and just today, even as he was in the days of Israel and Amos. So the question is, will America heed the warning signs and return to God? Or will God someday have to pour down his wrath and his judgment on America? Amos goes on in the next chapter chapters five through six, and identify some particular areas of sin in the nation of Israel. Four particular areas, the first being idolatry. Chapter five, verses one through six, let's read a couple of verses. Start in verse four. It says, this is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. For Gilgal will surely go into exile and Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live or he will sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. It will devour and Bethel will have no one to quench it. Now you look at that and you say, idolatry? Where's idolatry? Well, all three of the cities that are named there are centers of idolatry in Israel and Judah. Bethel, of course, is a city where King Jeroboam erected a golden calf, one of their main centers of idolatrous worship. And people would travel from all over Israel to go to Bethel to worship this golden calf. Gilgal was actually a site where Israel built an altar of remembrance after crossing the Jordan River. Samuel lived there, but apparently, what was once a memorial had now become an idolatrous object of worship, an idolatrous monument. Beersheba, 
had become a site of pilgrimage and idolatry. And but what's interesting about Beersheba, it's actually in the south. It's in Judah. And so Amos is even including Judah in some of these prophecies again. These are all sites of idolatry. Israel was deep into idolatry. They had adopted the religious practices of the Palestinian tribes around them. They worshiped the god Baal. And some of those religious practices uh, included um, going to religious prostitutes as well as child sacrifice. Can you understand why God is so upset with them and their idolatry? But there's a second sin, a sin called social injustice in verses 7 through 17. Let's read a couple of these verses in, in chapter 5. Verse 7 says, this is what the sovereign... Let's see, I've got to get down here. You who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. And then to skip over to, to verse 11, you trample on the poor and force him to give you grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses, how great your sins. You oppress the righteous and take bribes. You deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent man keeps quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you. You see, with Israel's prosperity came pride and social injustice. And the wealthy here are basically exploiting the poor rather than caring for their brothers as they are supposed to, as they are called to by God. They charge exorbitant interest rates when they loan money to the poor. And when the poor can't pay the interest rates, they enslave them in order to pay off the debt. Even the court system is unjust, infected with what we might call a two-tier justice system. Judges were accepting bribes, twisting the justice system so there's no justice for the power, powerful, but there's and no mercy for the poor. It kind of goes both ways. What's interesting is 300 years later, there's a guy named Nehemiah. Do you remember Nehemiah? The book of Nehemiah is this type of social injustice that is exactly what brought the rebuilding of the walls to a screeching halt. Oh, they had all kinds of, uh, of abuse from outside, but they kept building. But as soon as there were issues on the inside, in the, in the nation of, of Judah, well, that brought the building to a screeching halt. And only after the Jewish aristocrats repented of exploiting the poor and forgave debts and released slaves, only then did the rebuilding of the walls resume. Social injustice. The third sin is empty religion. In chapter 5, verses 18 through 27, let's begin reading in verse 21. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God which you have made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. See, Israel had, had all these external religious rites and rituals and ceremonies. They had them down pretty good. They had them down pat. They knew exactly everything they were supposed to do. And so they went through all the motions of their religious feasts and their offering sacrifices, but their hearts remained far from God. They even sang songs of praise while they continued to treat their brothers unjustly and poorly. They bowed to idols and golden calves and shrines of their kings. Their religion was all external ritual with no internal heart relationship with God. Then the last of their sins in chapter 6 is pride and indifference. Once again, their success and prosperity led to pride and indifference. Let's read a couple of verses there. Verse one, woe to you who are complacent in Zion and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. 
You notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. You see that? They're, they're, they're sitting there fat and sassy, complacent, indifferent. Get down to verse, verse four. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over that rule or over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. Once again, their success, their prosperity, led them to pride and indifference. They have this eat, drink, and be merry kind of attitude in Israel. They're lounging in luxury while the poor can barely find food to eat. They have this prideful attitude. We've earned it. We deserve it. You ever hear any of those attitudes in America? While well, they're indifferent toward their fellow Israelites who have little. God hates pride and indifference. And so he will smash through their walls and defenses. God will rain down judgment and Israel will be taken. Let me just throw in one more little note here. What's interesting is, is each of these judgments, these sermons kind of include a phrase. For instance, the end of, verse, of chapter five, he says, therefore I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord whose name is God Almighty. Literally, Yahweh, God Almighty, or literally, Yahweh Elohim Sabaoth, which literally means Yahweh, God of hosts. Or what we would say, God of the heavenly armies. Oh, you think your armies are so strong. <laughs> God can use any army he wants, but he has the greatest army of all. He is the God of hosts, the God of the heavenly angels, the God of the heavenly armies. And it's those armies, that host of armies, that will rain down judgment. So did you see those four sins of Israel? Idolatry, social injustice, empty religion, pride, and indifference. Is America guilty of any of those sins? Are we guilty of idolatry? Do we trust any false gods? Do we have any idolatrous cities to which Americans like to travel for vacation on their pilgrimages? Are we guilty of empty religion? Do we go through the motions with no heart? Is there a form of godliness with no relationship? Does America have an attitude of pride and indifference? Do we indulge in luxurious living and ignore the poor? Do we have a I deserve it kind of attitude? And I gotta tell you, today in America, the gap between the wealthy and the poor is increasing exponentially. And what are the wealthy doing? Are they ignoring the poor? Now, don't get me wrong. I would, am not in any way advocating any kind of socialism or government redistribution of wealth. Not at all would I do that. But it really is a personal issue. It's a matter of my heart before God and how I treat other people. The Bible clearly tells us that when God blesses a Christian with wealth, or in any way that he does so, so that we can in turn be a blessing to other people. God doesn't want us to just hoard this wealth and, and live in this lap of luxury. God wants us to use what he gives us to bless people around us, to minister to the poor, to help other people. Beware, America. God has warned us many times. If we do not turn back to God, judgment may be just around the corner. And that brings us to chapter seven and eight. In chapter seven through eight, we see visions of judgment in which um, Amos gives us several visions or, or word pictures, if you will. In these visions, he sees different objects that illustrate the judgment. And let me just kind of walk you through them, okay? First one in chapter seven, verses one through three, is a vision of swarming locusts. You remember that from last week, right? Book of Joel. Well, locusts simply represents destruction of Israel's crops and, and subsequent famine in the land. 
The second vision is a vision of devouring fire, which pictures the total devastation of the land. All you gotta do is ask someone who lives in California about devouring fire and they can tell you about it because fires have destroyed their land and even communities as well. The third is a vision of a plumb line. And Bama says, Israel's out of plumb. They're not standing straight. The nation simply is not measuring up to God's standards. They violated God's covenant and broken God's righteous laws, which justifies then God's judgment. And then after that vision, there's a brief interlude where we see this dialogue between Amos and Amaziah, the high priest in Bethel. And you remember that Bethel is the center of idolatry with their golden calf built by King Jeroboam? Well, Amaziah goes and tattles to Jeroboam and, and uh, about Amos, and Jeroboam sends back a message to Amos through Amaziah. And basically, Am- Amaziah tries to pull rank on Amos and, and give this message from the king. Amos, go home. The king said, go home. Go back to Judah. Get out of here. But Amos... He doesn't back down at all. He can't pull rank now, okay, because he's just a country preacher, just a shepherd and a farmer, but he has a very strong message of judgment for Amaziah. Take a look at verse um, 17, if you will. Start in verse 16. Now then, hear the word of the Lord, you say. Do not prophesy against Israel. Stop preaching against the house of Isaac. That's what, that's what Amaziah is trying to tell Amos. And then he says, therefore, this is what Yahweh says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up. And you yourself will die in a pagan country. And Israel will certainly go into exile away from their native land. I don't think he backed down too much, do you? He's not what we would call politically correct here, is he? He just kind of lets him have it with, with both fists, doesn't he? Amos or Amaziah, God's going to get you because you are leading the nation of Israel in this idolatrous worship in Bethel. Well, that brings us to another vision, the vision of the ripe fruit in chapter eight. The ripeness of the fruit, I think, indicates that the end of the harvest is near, and so it basically says Israel's coming to the end. They're ripe for God's judgment. Feasting will turn to mourning. Singing will turn to weeping. The end is near. And then the last vision, the vision of the Lord at the altar in chapter nine, verses one through 10. As I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he says, strike the tops of the pillars so that the thresholds shake, bring them down on the heads of all the people. Those who are left, I will kill with the sword. Not one will get away, none will escape. And it goes on from there. It's the vision of the Lord standing by an altar, presumably in Bethel, because this is probably where, where uh, Amos is. It pictures the time of God's visitation in judgment has arrived. That's what the picture is here. The the place where God desired to meet his people in grace has now become the site of his righteous indignation. So several of the images picture judgment. The last couple images picture the fact that judgment is certain. Judgment is coming. But Amos, as most of the prophets, doesn't stop there. He ends with a promise of hope, a message of restoration. Verses 11 through 15. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says Yahweh, your God. 
There's always a remnant. Always a remnant. A remnant of godly people. Even though the nation is scattered, there's still a remnant of people who trust God, who believe God, who love God. And the day is coming, Amos says, when God will bring Israel back into the land of blessing from all over the world. He will bring them back. Yes, they returned after the exile to some extent, but I think this is referring more to the final restoration uh, still future, when Jesus, when God will bring them back and Jesus himself will reign from Jerusalem in a reign of peace throughout the entire world. There is hope. There is a time of restoration coming. Keep your eyes looking up, looking to heaven. So that is a really quick survey of the book of Amos This is one of those books, as I studied it this week, that I'd like to go back and say, hey, maybe we need to do a whole series on this book. There's a lot there. There's a a lot in this book. Next week will be easier. Read the book of Obadiah. Just one chapter. I think that's next. Turn the page. Yep, Obadiah. Just one chapter. But what does this all have to do with us in 21st century America? This is like 2,800 years, 2,700 years later. Does this even apply to us today? Sure it does. I want to ask two questions, and then I just want to make a couple of observations. The two questions are simply this, and and I'm not going to answer them because we've already talked about them in, in quite a bit of detail here, but the two questions are simply this. Which sins of Israel are also true of America? And then secondly... Has America been warning God's, has America been ignoring God's warning signs? Have we ignored the harbingers of judgment? The warning signs that greater judgment is still coming? But then let me close with a couple of observations, actually three. First observation is this, God is holy and righteous. Amos is all about God's righteousness. All about the holiness of God. And because he is holy, he pours down wrath, his wrath on sin. Now today, in our 21st century, we don't really like to talk about the holiness and the righteousness of God. We we rarely discuss God's wrath and his judgment on sin today. We would much rather talk about God's love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and understandably so that's a lot nicer subject to talk about but we need to understand that God is both love and holy he's both gracious and righteous still today he's not just the God of love He's a, God, he's a just God as well. Because of that, second observation is this. Sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. There's a popular saying today in the political world, elections have consequences, right? Sin has consequences. Because God is holy, God must by his very nature judge sin. Some of God's judgment comes in the natural consequences of that sin. Sometimes God judges directly. But for all sin, there are eternal consequences, that being death, eternal death, and separation from God. Which brings us to the third observation, that is simply this, to live, we must seek God. We must seek God. On a national level, That simply involves repentance of sin and and prayer and turning back to God. But on a personal level, that simply involves seeking God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the solution. He paid the penalty for our sin. God judged our sin on the cross when Jesus died for us. And so when we turn to God through Jesus Christ, he is merciful and he will forgive our sin and will give us life. 
Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Every one of us are sinners. And there are consequences for that sin. Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Have you accepted his payment for your sin on the cross? Have you turned to him for forgiveness? If not, I would just encourage you today to do just that. In fact, I'd like to just close with a simple prayer of faith and just invite you, if you've never prayed a prayer like this, to just pray along with me, if you would. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. I just want to end with this prayer and just invite you to join me. Lord, just say, just, just say, Lord, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And I recognize that I'm a sinner, and because of my sin, Lord, you have to judge that. But thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to die on the cross, that, that he paid the penalty for my sin there. And through him, I can have eternal life, and I can have salvation. So, Lord, today I just place my faith in Jesus and accept your gift of salvation. And Lord, I just want to live for you. I commit my life to you right now. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. And Lord, I just thank you for each one here and for their love for you. And Lord, just thank you for this message. And Lord, as we pray for our country, I just pray just that. Pray for America that we might turn back to God. There have been so many warning signs, Lord. Just pray that we might wake up return to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and you prayed that prayer that I prayed for the first time, I would love to know about it. I invite you to do one of a couple things. You can just take a, the little uh, cards in front of you, the connection cards, and a spot on the back that just says, I committed my life to the Lord today. And I would love for you to just check that box, drop on the offering box, or hand it to me. Or you can just talk to me afterward and just let me know that you prayed that. I would just say, welcome into God's family. Seek God and you will live, what Amos says.